Well, howdy, 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 guys. It's the best time of the week. It's real men time. So make sure you park your monster truck, put away your machine guns. It's time for church. And uh, a bunch of dudes all over the world are gathering together tonight uh, to worship, to pray, to learn more about how to be a better man. Um, and actually, surprisingly, a lot of women tune into this because they're hoping their, men, their husbands become better men. So thank you, thank you for tuning in to Real Men this week. And if you're a senior pastor watching this right now and you want to figure out how to start this at your church, uh, email hello at realfaith.com. We'd love to get you connected here in Scottsdale. And if you're a man watching, eating some nachos across the country and you want to eat those nachos at Trinity Church, come check us out. Come uh, visit us at Real Men in Scottsdale, Arizona. All right, guys, get ready for an epic sermon. Here you go. All right. How are you guys doing? Good to see you. Welcome to Real Men. You're in the right place. You're with the greatest guys. We're very honored to have you. My name is Pastor Mark. What I do on Sunday, I preach a sermon. And then what we do at Real Men is a bit of a leadership pivot from that scripture or topic or text for the men. And so last weekend, we looked at Jesus Gethsemane prayers, most emotional, all night, angst ridden prayer. He is alone at the Mount of Olives. There is at the base uh, a garden and it's the garden of Gethsemane. And it literally is the place of the olive press. So they would harvest and then they would press the olives and then forth would come um, the olive oil. And Jesus is literally in a place where they physically press and he is being spiritually pressed. He knows that he is about to be betrayed. He is about to be executed, crucified, die on the cross in our place for our sins. He is up all night having a very deep, Deep, intense conversation with God the Father. He's in that incredibly painful moment. And uh, what I looked at last weekend was Jesus' experience. I want to look at it from a different angle. He also had three buddies he brought with him to the garden. For those of you that were present and awake for the sermon, thank you. Uh, what were the names of those three guys? Peter, James, and John, called Zebedee, which means the, the sons of thunder. They're like tag team wrestling name is what I always think about with the sons of thunder. So he brings Peter, James, and John with him. They're with him. How did they, how did they execute their responsibilities as friends? They get a, they get a straight F minus. The Larry Curley and Mo get a straight F minus in being a good friend to Jesus, right? And so what I want to look at is how do we learn from the negative example of Peter, James, and John? The Bible's filled with good and bad examples. Uh, some people, they do well. They're great positive examples. Other people, not so well. They are still examples. They're negative examples. In this occasion, Peter, James, and John, they serve as a negative example. They blew their opportunity to help Jesus in his time of greatest need. So let's just be honest. How many of us have done the exact same thing? Okay, if, if, how many of you were married? If you didn't raise your hand, go home and ask your wife if you've ever failed to be emotionally present, okay? And if she says, oh, you've been perfect, let me tell you this, you have a really nice girl uh, who, who's a liar, okay? And, uh, and a liar. Or ask your kids, his dad, have I always been there for you emotionally? You could count on me. The issue is we've all been Peter, James, and John, right? There has always been someone in our life that is going through something that they can't change. And there are oftentimes we fail. The good news is not that they failed, but that they learned from their failures and they became godly pastors and more helpful. We can learn from our failures. If Jesus allowed them to fail and learn their lesson, he's gonna allow us, even if we have failed, to learn our lesson to be there. And the big idea is, let's say it's not you going through your Gethsemane moment, but somebody you know or love. This could be your parents, right? Maybe your parents got health struggles. Uh, this could be a, a sibling or close relative, somebody you love, they're in a really hard season. This could be your spouse, this could be your kids, this could be your grandkids, this could be your friends. They're in that season and it's a season or a struggle that you can't fix it. You can't change it. What, what do you do? Well, let's just be honest. Somebody we know or love is going through something very difficult, very emotional. What are some of our options as men? We, we try to fix it. How many of you have tried it? And you, let's say you can't fix it. You can't fix it. What, what else can we try? We could ignore it. So we do this a lot, right guys? You're like, you're emotional. I didn't see that. I don't, I don't, I don't do emotion. You're crying. Oh boy. Oh, I got to go to the garage. Okay. We can ignore it. Um, we can make it worse. How many of you, somebody was having a hard time and or being emotional. You got involved and it didn't help. It got worse. You made it worse. We can ignore it, we can make it worse, we can make it better. 
And I wanna look at the case study here. And what happens is Jesus tells them what to do, but they don't do it, okay? They don't do it. So I wanna look at what Jesus tells them. And I want you to think not of your own season or struggle, that does matter, we do love you. Who is it that is in their Gethsemane moment? Who is it that you know you love, they're in it right now. And how could you be there for them to help them at their time of need so that they don't feel abandoned as Jesus was, okay? So I'm gonna ask uh, seven questions. Here's the first one. And they're all from Matthew 26. And we're just taking them from the Gethsemane prayer. What do they need from me, okay? Now, how many of us, we've been in a difficult season and someone thinks they're helping, but they're not doing what we need. You ever had that? Again, it's called marriage, right? Early on in our marriage, my wife would be like, she would try to fix the problems. And sometimes what I would say is, I just need you to hang out with me. I would come home from work. And let's say I had one of those days. I love grace with all my heart. But she'd be like, okay, tell me everything that happened today. (laughs) That's exactly what I don't wanna do. That's revisiting the crime scene. I I just wanna go, I don't wanna talk about it. I already went through it once. I don't wanna go through it again. She's like, well, I'm trying to help. The answer was, I love you. What would be helpful is not talking about it. Amen? Let's talk about something else. Let's watch a game. Let's make a margarita. Let's find a cage fight. Like there are tons of other things we could do. (laughs) Put those together and I'm not even going back to work. Okay, so what did they need from me? Matthew 26, 36, then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to the disciples, you sit here, I'm gonna go and pray. What does he tell him he needs? Just to be on standby, on call nearby. He's like, here's what I need. I need you guys to be available. That's what I need. How many of us as men, we rush in and we think we know what they need. And that's not what they need. So sometimes what happens as a man, you, some of you are learning to lead. You're, you're inserting yourself with your family. You're more engaged with your wife and or your kids. And I wanna commend you for that, okay? Praise God, that's amazing. But you can get really frustrated as a man. You're like, I stepped in and uh, they didn't respond very well. The question is, did you ask what they need? Did they ask what she need, right? I learned this very early on with Grace. She would tell me things and then I would put together a plan that we could execute together to solve that problem. And what Grace would say was, I don't need you to do anything. I just need you to listen. I was like, oh, this is weird. Uh, Okay, so I I listened. Did I do a good job? Uh, She just needed me to listen. It's like, um, you know, I was the lightning rod and just grounding out the storm and she didn't need me to do anything. She just needed me to listen. And then here's what she said. I need you to listen. And then I need you just to pray for me. Hmm, okay. Now that in that moment, that wouldn't have been what I needed. How many of you, you do for someone what you would want someone to do for you? And you do it and you're like, well, you're not even grateful. You don't even appreciate me. I'm trying so hard. <laughs> you should see the men's faces. Uh, this is what we've all done. And they're like, yeah, but that's not what I need. That may be what you would need, but that's not what I need. So the, the first question is like, what do, they, what do they need? Not what do I think they need? Not what do I assume they need, but what do I need? One of the greatest things that changed our whole marriage, and I'll talk a lot about my wife, Grace. Uh, she's the best, but uh, she, I would get home and she would, she would ask me, she'd say, um, what did you do today? And I said, I don't wanna talk about it. She said, well, how, how are we supposed to have a conversation? We need to connect. I said, well, here, why don't you ask me this question, Mark, how can I be a good friend today? See the difference? She was asking, what did you do? Ah, that doesn't really help. What I, what I would ask her is, can you ask me how to be a good friend? So when I, when I started coming home from hard days at work, Grace got into this habit. She'd be like, okay, how can I be a good friend right now? How many, that's amazing, right? Because nobody else asked me that question all day. She'd ask, how can I be a good friend? And I'd say, okay, honey, here's where I'm at. Here's what I need. I need to go for a walk and visit with you. I need to pray. I need to sit in my chair. I need nachos. I need nachos while I'm sitting in my prayer. It's been a very hard day. We're gonna need to double down on what I need. And what I learned was that I was serving her and she was serving me, but what we needed was very different. If we didn't ask one another, we would be serving one another, but we'd be annoying one another. So I just ask. So I'd ask her, what do you need? My wife, how many of your wives, 
my wife is very practical. I literally asked my wife recently, I was like, what do you need? She said, dishes and garbage. I was like, that's why we had five kids. I delegated all that. You know, I don't, she's like, no, I need you to do the dishes and take the garbage out. And I was thinking, pray for her, exegete Leviticus, cast a demon out, maybe sing some worship songs, pretty practical. The garbage goes outside and the javelina is knocked over the can and you're gonna need to pick that up. That's what's going on at my house. That's exactly what's going on in my house. So the first question is, what do they need? Second question, am I welcome to be physically present? Jesus uh, then says in 26, 37, taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. So he's got a crowd of people. He pulls the 12. And then out of that, he pulls the three. And he says, I need you guys to physically hang out with me, be nearby, be my buddies on call, be the guys on guard, okay? Sometimes as men, we'll see a need and we'll insert ourselves, but we've not been welcomed or invited. You guys ever done this? Some of you, now that you're learning to lead and you're getting a little stronger and a little bolder, you're like, well, I'm here to help. Well, do, do, they, do they want your help? How many of you have had somebody crash into your life? You're like, you were not invited, right? You, you were not invited. So unless we invite you, you know, we appreciate you, but we're not welcoming you. Jesus invites these guys. Um, simple things, even like when my kids, um, you know, got into their teen years, let's say I knew they were having a hard day or they're going through something. Your kids tend to go into the room and then shut the door. Okay. You kids ever done this? So here's what I do. It's dad, I love you. Can I come in and try and help? What I'm asking for is permission. Now it is my house. Um, the mortgage is in my name. So technically I, I, I do have a little authority here. But the reason I'm knocking on the door is I want them to invite me in. Okay, and what Jesus is doing here in prayer, he's inviting the father in. That's what we do when we pray. And he's inviting a couple of guys in. And sometimes what happens as men is either we never invite anybody in. Some of you guys have never invited anybody in. Jesus is having a hard day. He's gonna invite some guys in. And then those men need to know that they have been invited and they need to take that invitation. And one of the significant things that happens here at Real Men is that guys show up and they're looking for a couple of guys that they could invite in. If you get invited in, what do you need to do? You need to step in. Hey, I wanna to talk to you. Okay, great. I'd like to have you pray for me or with me. Okay, uh, my wife and I are struggling. You and your wife get along. I think maybe we do a double date and we ask you guys some questions. You know what they're doing? They're inviting you in, okay? But the key is until you've been invited in, if you insert yourself, you're just being rude. If they invite you, you're being welcome. So I want you to think of and be aware of as men, sacred opportunities where people are inviting you in. Because sometimes as men, we can just get so busy that we look past those sacred opportunities of invitation. So like uh, the other night, uh, my uh, youngest daughter, she came downstairs and I said, what are you doing? She said, I'm gonna go to the store. She's gonna run an errand, it was night. And I was like, uh, okay. I looked at her, I said, uh, you can go by yourself. I said, do you want your dad to go? She's like, well, do you wanna go? I said, I'll always go with you. I'm at, I love this girl. She said, yeah, dad, I'd really like that. I was in my pajamas, <laughs> okay? Now, let's be honest, I was in my pajamas. Have you ever seen a grown man at Target in his pajamas? <laughs> I did not want to be that guy. I don't want to be that guy. But I also didn't want to get out of my pajamas. So I'm in a real dilemma, <laughs> which means to love my daughter, I need to go get out of my pajamas. I was sitting in my pajamas. I was sitting in my chair. I had a glass of wine and I was watching a show. I was good. <laughs> Pretty much nailed my bucket list for that day. If Jesus came back, I'd be like, good to see you. Give me a minute, I'm good. So it was a good day. Now I gotta get my clothes on. Now I gotta get dressed. Now I gotta get my shoes on. Now I gotta turn my show off. Now I gotta get in the car. And now I gotta go to Joanne. First we went to Joanne Fabric. Okay, I thought we were just going to Target. I'm like, I could do Target. I like Target. I can go into either bathroom. It's fun. You know, it's fun for me. So, um, and then, 
<laughs> I'm not making stuff up. If you've never been to Target, try it. They're not going to stop you. You can do whatever you want. Um, <laughs> she's like, oh, we got to go to Joanne's. I was like, oh. Oh man, now I'm going to Joanne's. Now we're next level dad, okay? And I thought to myself, you know what? My daughter just invited me to be with her. So guess what? I'm gonna put pants on and go to Joanne's. That's what I'm gonna do, right? And ha had I missed that, I would have missed an opportunity to connect with her. And while we were driving, guess what my daughter did? She started talking to me about some stuff she's going through at school. So all of a sudden, it wasn't about going to the store, it was about her seeing if I was available, okay? And what a lot of times men will talk about is, well, we get a lot of quality time. <laughs> With kids, wife, it's, it's quantity time that provides quality time. How many of you, you can't look at your wife and be like, all right, Thursday from 1017 to 1021, we're gonna have deep heartfelt connection. <laughs> <laughs> And if you've tried that, right, I just saved you a lot of therapy. That is not going to work. How many of you, it's in the course of life, all of a sudden your wife just opens up. And you're like, I didn't see that coming. Or your kid just opens up and they invite you in. It's about being present and wait, waiting for the sacred windows of opportunity to open up. And we don't know when those are gonna be. Here for Jesus, he's having a hard day. He looks at the three guys. He's like, okay, you guys, come hang out with me. I need you today. I need you guys to be with me. He invites them in and they miss their opportunity. And I'm telling you, we all do this, but it's an, it's an awareness in the spirit of seeking to be more present so that when the people that we love are inviting us, especially when they're in a hard season, that ultimately we're available. Third one, uh, what are they feeling? Uh, Matthew 26, 36, here's Jesus. He began to be sorrowful and troubled. Is he feeling it? Yeah, he says, you know, I don't know how much longer I can bear this is what he's basically saying in the Gethsemane prayer. He's like, my soul is in anguish. I, I can't go anymore. He's very emotional, what he's feeling, okay? So the first question is, you know, what do they need? Second is, have I been welcomed in? Third is, what are they feeling? What are they feeling? And let me say this, one of the big mistakes that we make as men is we assume that everyone who goes through the same thing feels the same thing. How many of you have learned that? How many of you have raised even sons and daughters and they go through the same experience and the sons and the daughters process things very differently? I mean, I can still remember we're in one hard season as a family and I asked my daughter, I said, how are you feeling? She said, I'm scared, dad. I asked my son, he said, I'm angry. Okay, he's like, okay. They're going through the same thing, but they're feeling different things. And sometimes your kids will be acting up and this is kind of a parenting lesson for the dads. Sometimes your kids will be acting up and acting out. It's asking, what's behind that, All right? What's going on? It's not just the behavior. Something behind that is probably being driven by the, by the emotional life. Are they scared? Are they angry? Do they feel injustice? Are they hurt? Are they bitter? What is going on? What are they feeling? And how many of you have even found this with your wife? The two of you are going through the same thing and she feels something totally different than you do. I feel this all the time because my wife's name is Grace. My initials are M-A-D. <laughs> Mark Allen Driscoll, my initials are MAD. It's MAD and Grace, okay? So when MAD and Grace go through the same thing, we tend not to feel the same thing. She tends to feel, not a trick question, boys. Grace, I tend to feel mad, okay? It's prophetic, this was our destiny. So even when we go through things, so even when we would go through things, I would think my wife is feeling what I'm feeling. She's not. You can go through the same thing and feel totally different things. Back to this story in Gethsemane, Jesus is feeling anxious, sorrowful, troubled, up all night. What are the guys feeling? Nothing, they're asleep. So they're all in the same place. They're all going through the same thing and they feel totally differently. One guy can't sleep, the other guys sleeping fine, despite the fact that they're not supposed to be asleep. And so this is where as men, you and I, most, some of you are feelers, some of you are more relational, some of you are more intuitive. You will have this superpower that most men don't have and that is to be emotionally intuitive. Okay, most of us men do not have that superpower. It's something we learn. 
And we learn by asking, okay, so talk to me. How are you feeling? What are you dealing with? It's open-ended questions to draw out. Here, Jesus just tells us, this is exactly what I'm feeling. Sometimes, whether it's your wife, your kids, your friend, they'll just tell you. Other times, you're going to need to ask those leading questions and just ask, okay? Are his friends emotionally present to help him? Most men aren't. So I'm not going to read Peter, James, and John and say, I can't believe they failed. They seem like standard issue off the rack guys, right? This is, this is just how we come out of the factory, right? You got to get some additions and upgrades like emotions and empathy and presence, right? Those are, those are add-ons. They usually don't come with a standard guy out of the factory. The next question, and I apologize for this one because I know you're not going to like it. Uh, um, number four, the one before this, am I listening? Is that in my notes? No? No? Okay, we skipped it. All right, we'll skip to the next one then. Uh, nope, go back. The guy in the booth right now, he's having a heart attack. I apologize. Uh, am I staying focused? And he came to the disciples and found them. How many of us guys, our wife needs us, our kids need us, our friends need us, but we're going to bed. Amen? Like I've had a long day. I got another one tomorrow. You seem very emotional. Good luck. How many of you, your dad had a superpower where he could sleep in the chair no matter what was happening? <laughs> right? See, you young men, you're like, it's weird. Old men sleep in the chair when it's loud and crazy. Old men know it's a superpower that God only gives to men mature enough to wield that superpower. Okay? And he said to Peter, so you could not watch with me one hour. Now, how many of you, an hour seems like a long time. We're guys, right? It's like, just sit there and watch and pray for an hour. How many of us? You're like, hour's a long time. <laughs> God's a big God. I just talked to him briefly. I'm sure he's got it. We're moving right along. Okay. And what it is, is they start by praying and focusing, and then eventually they lose focus. And so Jesus, he's in it. He's not lost focus, but the men have lost focus. Okay, this is another thing that men do. We get started, but we, we get distracted. We lose focus, right? How many of you, your wife has been talking and for the first five minutes, you know what she's saying. And after that, you're like, I got no idea what we're talking about. I got no idea. Because I checked my phone. I started thinking about work. Um, I was trying to figure out some tax stuff. My mind is full, distracted. Uh, am I staying focused? And the key is when you're trying to help a person, especially a person that's hurting, it's like a sporting event. You got to finish the game. You can't just be, I killed it in the first quarter. Yeah, but did you finish? I mean, did you finish the fourth quarter? And this is really the difference between whether or not we build or break trust in our relationships. Because if you start, okay, I'm here. I love you. I'm listening. I'm praying. I'm present. Okay, I'm here. But then the fourth quarter comes and they're like, where did my team go? Like I was there in the first quarter. They're like, yeah, but I need you for the whole game. And I'll be honest in my relationship with Grace, particularly early on in our marriage, this was my failure. Okay, I was there. I listened. I was present. I prayed. I checked the box being a good husband. Now I got stuff to do. But she still needed me to be present or the kids needed me to be present. And it's that issue of staying focused. And what happens with the men is maybe they start for a few minutes, but by the time an hour comes, their focus is already diverted. So let's have an honest conversation as men. Your wife, your kids, your friend, your mom, your dad, somebody you know, somebody you care about, they're in a hard season. They've invited you in. You're present. You're listening. Maybe you're starting to engage. What are the very practical things that come in to get a man distracted and lose focus of what he's assigned to in that moment? Cell phone? Television? Television? Later. Dinner? It's an honest man. Mm. I need meat. Mm. Okay. What else? Kids. kids? How many of your kids are selfish? Right? When... <laughs> <laughs> 
Your kids are like, dad, I know you're struggling with the stock market and mom's emotional awareness is important. And I don't mean to cut in line. I'm just going to sit over here and read Lamentations. And whenever you're available, <laughs> I'd like you to be present. No, they're like, they just cut in line. Okay. Your kids can do that. And part of this, even with your kids, it's not ignoring them or not being present for them, but sometimes it is teaching them, particularly if you're married, your mom is my first priority. You're my next priority. You are a priority. Let me love and serve your mom. And then I'm going to get to you, but let me, let me help mom. And what you're doing there, you're maintaining the order that God intends for your home. And you're also discipling them one day to have a good marriage. I learned that one day because when I would come home from work, our youngest daughter, she, um, I, I mean, I just, I, I love her. She's my girl. I love her with all my heart. We're super, super close. And so I would come home and I'd give her mom a kiss and hug and give her a kiss and hug. And I didn't pay attention to it because whoever was closest to the door when I got in between my daughters and my wife, they got the first hug and the first kiss. Whoever was close, I'm just gonna hug and kiss the girls when I walk in the door. So whichever girl was closest gets the first hug and the first kiss. And there was one day I'll never forget, I walked in my young, I said, looked at my daughter, I said, come here. I said, I'm gonna give you a hug and a kiss. She said, you should give me a kiss after your beautiful wife. <laughs> I was like, man, okay, yeah, that's true. But she in her heart knew mom needs to be the priority and I'm second. And it's not that she's unimportant, it's that she's second, okay? And it's, it's very healthy because you had a marriage before the kids showed up, you'll have a marriage after the kids leave. So in the middle, you need to keep your marriage as a priority, okay? But other things that can distract a man's focus, for sure kids can. Technology does for sure, right? How many of you guys, sports, the election, housing market, stock market, work. I mean, phone is one of the most disruptive things to an emotional, healthy presence in your relationships, okay? Sometimes you literally need to do something crazy, turn your phone off or just leave it out of the way, okay? Some men would have better marriages if they literally just turned off their phone at a certain time every day and turned it on at a certain time the next day. That in and of itself would change the trajectory of the, of the household. Other things that distract us. Sometimes it's your dog, your pet, your hobby, your chores. Like as men, true or false, we can justify a lot of distraction. We have things. I got five kids, I got a wife, I got a German shepherd, I got a Fisher Price edition Jeep that keeps breaking. It's in the shop again, pray for me. Um, I broke the front end, I broke the tie rod ends, I broke the axle, I just broke the drive shaft, I broke the rockers, I broke the cam, I broke the windshield, okay? It's in the shop again, it's in the shop again, it's always in the shop. And so for me, even just lately, just driving is kind of a thing. It's just kind of a thing. Life breaks, things happen, right? Just we live in this world, whereas men, we never get to ever finish our to-do list of things that need to be done. And if what you're thinking is, when I get it all done, then I'll be emotionally, physically, spiritually present, then the answer is, you'll never be physically, emotionally, spiritually present. Because guess what? The list never ends. Right? Thanks to Adam and the curse in the fall, the work is never done. It's never done. I tried very hard to get all my work done so I could be present for my wife and kids. And I had twice in my life, uh, blew out my adrenal glands and had intestinal ulcers. I was trying to get all my work done. And what I realized was I can't get all my work done, that the curse is very real. And I'm going to die before I get all my work done. And if what that means is that people like Grace and the kids or family, friends, my folks, whatever the case might be, whomever matters to me greatly, if they're in front of me and it's like, I will get to you once I get everything done, then I am going to ignore them for my whole life. Or I'm gonna do like we talked about, I'll get engaged and then I'll get distracted and I'll lose focus. And what that'll do is that'll get their hopes up. Okay, he's gonna help. I can depend on him. No, I can't. Okay. No, I can't. I mean, just the picture that comes to mind, it was some years ago, we were in uh, Redmond, Oregon, 
we're on vacation as a family. And uh, I remember uh, taking my kids to the pool. Uh, if you live in a place like the Northwest, when the sun comes out, it's a really big deal. So you go outside and find a pool. If you're in Arizona, you're like, we've done this before. This was, uh, this was outside of the People's Republic of Oregon. It was up and to the left. And, uh, and so we were in, uh, we were in uh, Redmond and Bend, Oregon, and we were on vacation and I'm there with the kids. And I came down to the pool and I took my kids to the pool every day for about a week. The kids were little and, you know, flipping them and doing all this stuff. And uh, there was a whole bunch of kids in the pool. There were zero dads in the pool. Guess what the dads were doing? They were work. They all had their laptops and their phones. They were taking calls and doing work, okay? And day two, day three, day four, day five, I saw guys literally put their family in a car, drive a great distance, spend a lot of money, go to a pool to ignore their children. Okay? And the whole time they're working and their kids are in the pool. And I thought, man, these guys are 10 feet away from having a relationship. But they're, they're just, they're simply not emotionally, they're not mentally, present. They're completely distracted. And then you would see the dads kind of engage. They talk to their kid or one dad got up and he's throwing the football. And so he's starting to engage. And then the kids are jumping in. Boom. Next thing you know, phone rings, he's gone. And the day is over. He started, but he lost focus. Okay. What I'm saying is that what Peter, James, and John do are what all men do until we learn to do it differently that our default is not to be present, not to be emotionally available, not to finish the fourth quarter, not to be counted on. Uh, we start in the position they started in, and it's not to beat you guys down, but it's to make us aware. Because what you may not understand as a man is how powerful you are, how powerful you are. Like your wives depend on you and need you. Your children depend upon you and need you in a way, quite frankly, that you probably don't need or depend upon anyone else. True? Okay. My kids need me in a way that I don't need anybody else. I'm the dad. My wife needs me in a way that I don't really need anybody else. I'm the head of household. Right. In this moment, Jesus has a need for Peter, James, and John, his three closest friends and his ministry leaders. These are supposed to be the guys that he can depend on. He needs them. They're not there. Okay. Next question. Um, uh, how can I watch and pray? I, I didn't make this one up. Matthew 26, 41, Jesus says, watch and pray. Okay. So let me make this very, very practical. Many men don't pray because they don't watch. Okay. So how, as a man, how do you watch? How do you watch? Be practical. Permission to speak freely. Stay connected. Stay connected. So it's actually being present. Amen. Just paying attention. Hey, I saw that. Can I pray about that? I saw this, saw that, pray this, pray that. It's just, it's paying attention. And because as men, what sometimes we think is it's, I don't need to deal with it unless somebody brings it to me. But if I'm a man, I'm looking to see if there is a place that I'm needed. Uh, I'll give you guys an example. I, uh, I missed my son's basketball game today. I love to go to all my kids' sports and I missed today. Overtime, my son got fouled with a game-winning shot, hit one free throw, I think missed the other, tie game. His team goes home tied because he missed the free throw. He's a high school freshman. You know what I need to do tonight? I check in. Say, okay, son, how you doing, buddy? You nailed one free throw? Woo, you missed the other. <sighs> you know, that, what, that's your bar mitzvah. You're a man now, all right? So uh, it's, I got to check. I got to check. So the whole time I'm asking Grace, she's at the game. How's he doing? How's he playing? Where are we at? What's going on? It's just trying to be attentive. Okay. And as men, we want to be there physically whenever we can, but there are times that we can't be there. We can still watch and be aware and check in. Okay. Other ways that a man can watch so he knows what to pray for. 
Just listening. It's a crazy idea where men ask questions and listen. One of the greatest things you can do is just ask open-ended questions. I ask my kids all the time, so what can I pray for you about? What can I be praying for you about? What can I help you with? What do you need? What, I, what can I do for you? And I'll ask this question, who can I pray for? I'll just open-ended questions to get them to talk. And then occasionally, um, they'll drop a bomb that I didn't know that they were carrying. Uh, one of my kids the other day, I was driving them home um, from school, and I said, is there anything I can be praying about or anyone I can be praying for? Oh, quiet, 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 quiet. He said, my buddy at school today said that his dad filed for divorce. He's got a girlfriend. He just walked out on my friend and the kids. And my friend is the oldest son and he is really hurting and he doesn't know how to explain this to his younger siblings. And I was like, oh my gosh. I was like, who did he tell? He said, only me. Oh, so buddy, I, I got to coach you to help your friend, right? I, I got to watch and pray, right? And they literally pray for him, trying to coach him up. Okay, here's, oh my gosh, okay, here's, here's what's going on. Here's, here's what I think you can do to help your friend, okay? But what oftentimes happens is men, we assume if you don't say anything, everything's what? Okay. So it's okay. And this is what men say all the time, like, you didn't say anything. Usually the wife is like, you didn't ask. Or the kid's like, you didn't ask. Or sometimes what'll happen is we seem so busy that they would ask, but they don't want to interrupt us because they don't know that they're the priority. Okay? Other things that men can do to watch and pray. Because once you watch, then you know what to pray for because you're seeing what the needs are. You know what our kids are involved in. You got to know what your kids are involved in. And let me say this, dads, you got to get into their world a little bit. This includes checking their social media. How many of you think you know your kid and you log onto their social media? You're like, row, row. Uh, right. This is getting to know their friends. This is showing up at their school. This is going to their sports, their hobbies, their activities, walking into their bedroom, checking out their social media. It's not stalking them. It literally is as they get bigger, they get a world and you've got to go into that world. And part of watching is seeing it. Like, okay, like who is my kid and what are they, what are they doing and where are they at? So then you can, you can pray. You could pray with them and you could pray for them, okay? And what Jesus is telling the men here, Jesus is teaching these men how to minister to him. I believe he knows that they are going to fail him, but they will learn from this to minister to others, okay? And the good news is John becomes an incredible pastor. Uh, Peter, James, servants, Peter's not perfect, but he does grow and change. And I love the story, not because of how painful it was for Jesus, but because if these are his best guys and they blew it, then if we blow it, we're not the worst guys. And if they learned how to do it differently, be emotionally present, listen, pray, support, empathize, serve, walk through the hard time, if they learned that, we can learn that. And that's the last the last question in the section, uh, how can I walk with them in their suffering? Uh, Matthew 26, 45, sleep and take your rest. Later on, see the hours at hand. Let me say this real quick. Men, there are certain sacred windows of opportunity that when you miss them, they're gone. They're just gone, right? This is why every dad says, I'm walking my daughter down the aisle. And I don't care what happens at work that day. I'm leaving because that's a sacred window of opportunity. The day your kid is born, sacred window of opportunity. Um, there are sacred windows of opportunity that sometimes we can anticipate and prepare for. The hardest thing for a man is when it's a sacred window of opportunity that we didn't know about. And we literally just need to make the hard adjustment and pivot and say, this is now very, very important. I, I, did, I didn't know this was coming. This is this is coming, okay? And, what G and these guys think it's just a normal day. They think it's a normal day. Is it a normal day? No, it's, it's, this is a big day. And oftentimes what happens for men, it's not that we're indifferent, it's not that we don't care, it's that we get very busy, we think it's a normal day and we miss the window of sacred opportunity to be available. They did that for Jesus. What he's saying is, guys, you can sleep anytime you want, this is the only day they're gonna crucify me. 
So there's one day you can walk with me to the cross and then any other day you could take a nap. This is a sacred window, okay? And let me say this as men, this is the key to leadership is seeing when there is a sacred window of opportunity and availing ourselves to it so that we can be there for the people that we care about, okay? And you don't always know when that is going to happen. You just don't know. So that's part of the watch and pray. Part of the watch and pray is seeing, okay, is this not just another day, another meal? We had this at the dinner table the other night. I always ask, how are you doing? How can I pray for you? And usually the kids are like, doing great. You know, pray for my test or whatever. My daughter broke down. And she's like, man, dad, I'm really struggling. I hate this online school thing and open and closed and girl drama and boys. And dad, I just, I just feel a little, and she's, boom, her heart just opens wide open. And you know what? I had a ton of work to do. That was gonna be my late night. I had a lot of deadlines to meet. And guess what? I gotta sit at that dining room table and I gotta talk to that teenage girl because she just opened her heart. And if I don't walk in, then there may be a day that she closes her heart. And as a dad, I can't have that. I need to keep that door to her heart open, okay? I need to, and so I need to, when she welcomes me and I gotta walk in. Honey, okay, dad's here, I'm turning off my phone, flush my work, tell the brother, go do your homework. I'm just gonna visit with your sister and see what I can do here, okay? Without being super religious or spiritual, how do you think that meeting ended? What do you think I did? Prayed over. Because I can't fix it and I can't change it. I can't make teenage girls be mature. Okay? If I could, I'd be so rich. Right? <laughs> you guys would pay me anything. <laughs> I can't make teenage girls be mature, but I can empathize with my daughter and I can pray for her. Okay? So I can't fix it, but I can make sure she's not alone through it. Okay? So close with this. Uh, back one. Sorry, PowerPoint guy. I've made your life complicated. Sleep and take your rest later on. See the hours at hand. The son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. My betrayer is at hand. Here's what's crazy about Jesus. He says, um, there's my murderer. I need, I need to go see him. Okay. Some people think that Jesus is weak. He's not. He's fearless. But he just knows what the will of God is and he walks in it fearlessly. The only way to be a fearless man is not to be courageous or tough, but to know what God's will is. Okay, I'll just tell you right now, any guy going to be murdered, unless you know it's God's will, you will not be fearless. Okay, if it's like that guy's gonna shoot you in the head. Cool, well, I better get there. Why? Because that's God's will. I mean, once you know what God's will is, you become fearless. And the way you get God's will is in prayer. Jesus is up all night praying and he's come to this conclusion, not my will, your, be, your will be done. That's what he prays. And he literally prays to bring himself in alignment with the will of God. And then he walks boldly, fearlessly, courageously into the will of God. The only way to be a courageous man is to know the will of God and walk in it. And what he invites is, he invites the guys to what? To go with him, to go with him. And so when someone is going through it, that's the question, how can I walk with them in their suffering? Okay. How can I walk with them in their suffering? Some of you guys are more compassionate. You're more empathetic. You're more natural at this. I'll just say most of us guys, this is a learned art and skill. Somebody's suffering, having a hard time. I avoid that. It's emotional. Oh my gosh, there's tears. I think they're going to want me to listen. Like, oh my gosh. And what, what it is, it's for you guys that have some of these skills either because of your disposition or your gifting or your experience, you can help the other guys learn to grow in some of these experiences, okay? And help them to build relationships because what happens is, men, there are certain painful things that the people that we know and love are going through. This is the most painful day of Jesus' whole life. But what those are, those are strategic opportunities to build the deepest relationship and the greatest trust. So as a man, don't look at it and say, how can I remove it? Or how can I fix it? Or how can I avoid it? The question is, how can I connect with you through it to build our relationships so that you are not alone? 
and that I'm present in it and with it and, and for you and through it, okay? And ultimately, this is the next level of leadership that I believe God is calling you to as men. What I've seen thus far from you men as we've been meeting, you're activated. You're reading your Bible, you're praying. So you guys are in rare error. Now you guys are praying with your wives and you're leading your families and you're engaged with your kids. And I just wanna honor all of that. What I'm saying is now when the hard times come, those are the best opportunities to build the deepest trust and the greatest strength and health in the relationship. And once you've proven yourself faithful in those moments, what you will find is when other opportunities like that come, the people that are depending on you, they're gonna invite you in because they have realized that they can trust you because you've built trust, okay? And some of you men, I just feel inclined to say this in the spirit and then I will close. Some of you right now that you are engaged with your wife and your kids and prayer and the scriptures and the spirit, things are coming up and you're like, oh my gosh, we got all these issues. They were there. And now they're aware because you're ready to enter in. It's not that those things weren't there, it's that you weren't watching, that you weren't present, that you weren't paying attention, that you weren't noticing. And some of you right now, just think about people in your life. You're really getting to know your kids, your wife, the condition of your family, your business, your friends, your parents. You're like, I'm actually seeing some things. You're like, oh my gosh, this is really bringing to the surface some things. Exactly, which is where you now have an opportunity to enter in and to be present, to listen, to watch, to pray, to serve, to unburden, and to walk the process with them to bring them to the point that God has for them, okay? So you're ready. The reason I'm telling you this, you're ready. And the reason that maybe you didn't see this before is you weren't ready, okay? And then uh, we're gonna do some time around uh, the table. Who needs to be present? Who needs you to be present and prayerful them right now, right? Here's Jesus having his Gethsemane moment. He needs Peter, James, and John. Who's in their Gethsemane moment needs you to be a Peter, James, or John? Who is that, okay? And number two, just how can we pray for you? We're gonna spend a lot of time in prayer. Father God, thanks for an opportunity to kind of verbal process and talk with the men. And Lord Jesus, thank you that you were willing to have your friends fail you. Uh, it's not your fault, Lord, it's their fault, but you endured that. To give us an example that as men, when needed, especially in hard, emotional, complex, exhausting, overwhelming, unplanned, unscheduled, maybe even unprecedented circumstances, God, we know we're Peter, James, and John. Uh, we fall asleep, we don't pay attention, we start and stop, we lose sight and focus. And so God, thank you for the encouragement that they didn't start well, but they finished well. And Lord, I pray for us as men, the vast majority of us are not gonna start well, but we're gonna finish well. And Lord, I feel inclined in the spirit to even pray for the older men, the men who would think, gosh, my kids, my grandkids, I've not been there, I've not stepped in, I've not been dependable, I think I missed my window of opportunity. Lord, I just think a lot of healing could come if they would uh, take those opportunities and in the spirit just respond assertively and humbly and differently. I think it could really heal a lot of loss and a lot of grief and a lot of loneliness maybe in their wife or their kids or their grandkids. And Lord, for the men who are young, help them to learn these lessons early so that their wives and kids could depend on them and be uh, certain that they'll be present for them. And, uh, and Lord, pray as a result that the worst time would build the best relationships, that the hardest seasons would build the deepest trust. And God, I'm proud of these men. I'm really deeply, profoundly proud of them. God, I'm seeing men lead, um, lead themselves. I'm seeing men pray. I'm seeing men read their Bible. I'm seeing men repent and apologize. I'm seeing men love their wives. I'm seeing men pursue their children. God, I'm seeing kids uh, with engaged fathers. I'm seeing wives with engaged husbands. And God, I'm seeing miracles. And uh, I just wanna say thank you for the encouragement that these men are. And I pray God that we'd learn from the lesson of Peter, James, and John, that when the people we know and love are in it and going through it, that even if we didn't get it right last time, we'd do better this time. In Jesus' name, love you. Thank you, guys.